Vice City, a paradise filled with expensive suits, flashy cars, and beautiful women. A city run by dealers and weasels. The nights illuminated by the neon lights from its hotels and clubs. But under its glitz and glamour, you've got another crime-infested city with big timers vying for power. Unlike GTA 3 and GTA 4, I don't really have a story for my first time playing Vice City. I remember being young, and chances are I did play it not too long after its release on PS2, and I've only recently found out it debuted a year after GTA 3 too. Which is wild considering how long it's taking to get GTA 6 at the moment. Oh, how I miss the shorter development times of the older generations. But what I can say about Vice City is that it's the GTA game I've replayed the most over the years. A game that feels like what you'd get if Scarface and Miami Vice did the fusion dance. The glitz and glamour of the 1980s told through the lens of a fictional Miami. With over the top and out there characters who weren't just part of another crime group. And of course it's incredible soundtrack that perfectly captures the atmosphere of the era. It all comes together to create one of the best and most memorable GTA experiences that I absolutely love revisiting. Before I dive into discussing my latest playthrough, let's go over what's new in Vice City. First, with a bigger world to play in, we got ourselves an in-game map. Nothing too mind-boggling, just a standard in-game map with a legend for key places, being able to zoom in and out, and important things like mission givers and your safe houses being marked off along with the locations of pay and sprays and ammunitions. So you can pull up the map to find the nearest one as opposed to just having to memorize it like in GTA 3. Since I just brought it up, next we got safe houses and assets. One of my issues with GTA 3 was that you'd have so much money but nothing to really spend it on outside of weapons and ammo. Here you can buy new apartments dotted across the map, making the travel from finishing a mission to save your game much shorter. Assets, meanwhile, let you invest in local businesses, allowing you to have a constant stream of revenue, so you never have to worry about running out of cash. I'll touch a little more on assets later in the video. Next, the driving has been tweaked. Cars handle a lot better and have more weight to them. Now, if you're speeding around trying to dodge the cops or whoever, your car won't just flip over if you try and take a corner too hard. And you have a small amount of control as your car is about to flip over and can sometimes save your ride if it starts tipping over. But if your car does catch fire, you no longer have to wait for it to make a complete stop and can bail out before it blows. On the topic of driving, we got ourselves some new vehicles. We got motorcycles that are fast and lightweight, which are the perfect choice for drive-bys. Though if you tap against an object at any speed, you'll see yourself go flying off the thing. To accommodate the bigger map, we now got air travel in the form of helicopters and planes. Their controls and how they handle are surprisingly much better than expected, especially as it took me a bit to get used to it in GTA 4. Though turning can feel a little slow, especially with helicopters, and precise landings aren't always the smoothest. You can now change your character's clothes, which while not giving you any real customization options like San Andreas, it feels refreshing to change up your look from time to time and not get stuck staring at the same boring outfit all game. Shooting gets an update, as the lock-on is snappier and doesn't feel slow like it did in GTA 3. You can also switch between targets, which you could also do in GTA 3. Oops. Yeah, sorry about that guys. As some comments pointed out in that video, you could actually switch between targets in GTA 3. Since the lock-on was so iffy, and I didn't get in firefights with enough enemies placed together, I never actually tried switching targets. So that's all on me. <laughs> and finally, the biggest addition, we got ourselves a voice protagonist. Our new lead, Tommy Versetti, is brought to life by the legendary Ray Liotta. Oh, I swear my fucking mother, if you touch her again, you're dead! Oh. Tommy is a made man in the Ferrelli crime family in Liberty City, and he spent the last 15 years of his life in jail for a hit gone wrong. He was sent to kill a rival gang member, but was ambushed, managing to survive after racking up a body count of 11, earning the nickname the Harwood Butcher. Ah! 
Unlike Claude from the last game, who was just a mute plank of wood with no personality to speak of, Tommy is rude, loud, and temperamental, usually keeping a professional demeanor, but quick to blow up on you if you piss him off, and he has no issues with using violence to solve his problems. Unlike most GTA protagonists, who are mostly hired thugs, Tommy aspires to make it to the top, to rise from the bottom of the criminal underworld and take control of Vice City, eliminating anyone who stands in his way. But will Tommy's lust for power be his undoing and ultimate downfall? Let's find out. Before diving in, I just want to fill you all in that for this video, I'm playing the PS2 original version of Vice City on the PC X2 emulator. And I'll explain why in just a little bit. Tommy Vecetti? <laughs> shit. Didn't they ever let him out? The game kicks off in Liberty City, circa 1986, with the Ferrelli family sitting around a table discussing the recent release of Tommy Versetti. Sonny Ferrelli, the Don of the family, has some misgivings about Tommy being free, as his reputation and temperament could be bad for business. He suggests they send him down south to Vice City in order to expand their family's reach and power, wanting to dip their toes into the drug game that the rest of the families refuse to touch. Arriving in Vice City, Tommy is picked up by the family's contact, the neurotic lawyer Ken Rosenberg. He facilitates a deal with some local brothers in order to buy coke. At the exchange, things don't go smoothly, as the group are ambushed by an outside party, killing the dealer along with the two guys Tommy was with. He bails and escapes with Rosenberg back to his office, losing the money Sonny fronted him in order to buy the drugs. Now taking control of Tommy, I'll fill you in on why I chose to play an emulated version of the original PS2 release. First is that it just makes recording footage a lot easier for me. But more importantly, because of something that's missing from the PS2 Classics version and the Definitive Edition. Yep, Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. It's programmed to be the first song you hear when you first step into a car and might as well be the game's official theme song. Ever since I first played Vice City, any time I heard the song in real life, along with I Ran by A Flock of Seagulls, I'd instantly be taken back to memories of playing the game. Unfortunately, since Rockstar didn't want to pony up the money to relicense the songs, it's missing from every updated release of the game, along with some other tracks. The original PC version still had the song, but good luck downloading and trying to get that version working properly though. And call me crazy, or a purist, or whatever, but Vice City just doesn't feel like Vice City without the song to me. It's like playing Ocarina of Time without the Hyrule Field theme. Or Metal Gear Revengeance without Rules of Nature. Like the game loses a piece of its identity. But before anyone throws a fit, this is just my opinion and personal preference when it comes to replaying the game. I realize getting your hands on the original version of the game isn't feasible for everyone. So play whatever version you prefer and have fun. I'm not here to act like some elitist to preach to you that my way is the only way. Because gaming is for everyone and all that jazz. After dropping off Ken at his office, Tommy heads to the Ocean View Hotel, which will serve as your safe house for the first part of the game. He calls up Sonny to give him the bad news about the deal. And needless to say, his boss is less than pleased to hear what happened. Look, Sonny, we were set up. The deal was an ambush. Harry and Lee are dead. You better be kidding me, Tommy! Tell me you still got the money. No, Sonny. I don't have the money. That was my money, Tommy! My money! Tommy promises he'll find out who ambushed the deal and get the drugs and money back. Man, barely a day in Vice City and Tommy's life has immediately gone to shit. Checking in on Rosenberg the following day, he's a mess. Terrified that the Ferrellis are going to rain hell on him for the deal going bad. Ken Rosenberg is almost an exact one-to-one -one of Sean Penn's character, David Kleinfeld from the movie Carlito's Way. Everything from his looks, the way he talks, his coke habit, and even his office are all styled after Kleinfeld. He's voiced by William Fitchner, who has a pretty long Hollywood career, but most of you might recognize him as the guy from the opening scene of The Dark Knight. You have any idea who you're stealing from? You and your friends are dead! He's out, right? Tommy gets Rosenberg to calm down and puts him to work trying to figure out who stole from them. He suggests talking to the man who set up the deal in the first place, 
Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez. Colonel Cortez is having a party on his yacht with all the big players in Vice City. So Rosenberg suggests that Tommy take his invite and hit up the party. But only after the ex-con changes into something more presentable. What the hell, Rosenberg? I've been locked up for 15 years. Don't poor shame me in my fashion sense. I do think it's pretty funny that Tommy feels a bit hurt after his clothes are insulted, though. Who does that guy think he is? Now I gotta dress like a chump as well as hang out with them? I like this shirt. Getting some new threads and some new wheels. Hmm, nice bike. Tommy soon arrives at the party. Colonel Cortez greets him as he arrives, assuring Tommy he started his own investigation into who ambushed the deal. Cortez is a retired military colonel of some unspecified Central American country, having left his homeland to set up a drug trafficking ring here in Vice City. He's very polite and cordial, always treating Tommy with an air of respect. He's voiced by Robert Davi, probably best known as the villain Franz Sanchez in the James Bond movie License to Kill. After the pleasantries are over, Colonel Cortez asks his daughter Mercedes to show Tommy around. Mercedes is your stereotypical rich party girl, who takes an instant liking to Tommy as she shows him around, pointing out the various people at the party, some who Tommy will work with later, and others who seem important but have no plot relevance whatsoever. Like Pastor Richards, for example, who appears in the manual for the game and can be heard on the radio, but apparently had his role in the game cut. The final guest to join the party is Ricardo Diaz, a drug baron who controls and supplies most of the coke in Vice City. He's voiced by Luis Guzman, who you probably know from, well, from a lot of things, really. Dude's got a long list of movies and shows. His next big role playing Gomez Adams in that Wednesday Netflix show. Though I mostly remember him as Pachanga from Carlito's Way. Fun fact, Lalin, that guy in the wheelchair, that's Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. Once Ricardo sets his eyes on Mercedes, she scampers away with Tommy asking him to drop her off at the pole position club. While we got our foot in the door with Colonel Cortez, Tommy's no closer to figuring out who ambushed the deal. Returning to Rosenberg for the next mission, Tommy thinks they should talk to someone who's got their ear to the street and may know something about the missing drugs. Rosenberg suggests a British guy named Kent Paul, who's always partying at the Malibu club. Heading to the club, Tommy politely, but sternly, Ask Kent about any info he may know about the stolen drugs and money. He points the finger at a dealer who works as a chef, one who's been awfully happy about business as of late. Finding the chef, we put the beats to him to try and get some info, but go a little overboard and kill him, only getting a cell phone. A mysterious stranger in a white suit shows up afterwards, also on the trail of whoever ruined the drug deal. He doesn't have time to introduce himself as the chef's buddies show up and want revenge. After gunning them down, the stranger will show us where the local ammunition is. Buying weapons from ammunition has been revamped. In GTA 3, you'd have to walk over a weapon in order to buy it, but have to wait a few seconds for it to respawn and then walk over it again to buy more ammo. Here, everything is up on the wall, easy to switch between weapons or armor, and you can just mash X to stock up on ammo. To go along with ammunition, there are now hardware stores that will sell you a random assortment of melee weapons. Returning to the hotel, the stranger will be in touch and will continue digging up info about who ambushed the deal. Who could this mysterious person be, I wonder? Before starting the next mission, Tommy will get a call on the cell phone he nabbed from the chef. The person on the other line mentions needing to move Diaz's merchandise and having to make a deal soon. Tommy doesn't even try to pretend to be the chef, Leo, spooking whoever is on the other line into hanging up. The plot thickens. Dropping in on Rosenberg and giving him a rude awakening, he fills Tommy in that the Ferrellis are planning to visit soon if the money or drugs aren't found. In the meantime, they've asked for a favor, requesting our services in helping Sonny's cousin avoid five years in jail for fraud. Time for some good old-fashioned jury tampering. It's a simple mission, just intimidating the jurors by smashing up their cars. Afterwards, Sonny will call and remind Tommy his time is running out to find that missing cash. Returning to Rosenberg's office, we meet construction tycoon Avery Carrington, who was previously at the yacht party. He's voiced by the late, great Burt Reynolds, 
You may remember him from such films like Smokey and the Bandit, or Smokey and the Bandit 2, and also as Mayor Burt Reynolds in Saints Row the Third. Viola, is this the kid you were talking about? Burt fucking Reynolds? Who else could keep this town running? Avery is very similar to Donald Love in GTA 3, both being huge businessmen who've built their fortune on buying and selling land. Though Avery has a more bombastic and cowboy-like personality, compared to Love's more reserved and polite attitude, he needs help in securing some land. The delivery company that's set up there is refusing to sell, so we gotta destroy their operation and run them out of business. Tommy first needs another wardrobe change, this time slapping on some overalls to disguise himself as a worker. Just outside the delivery company, a union strike has taken place. So we just have to stir up some trouble by punching some workers and causing a riot. The guards will open the gates and you can slip in to destroy their trucks. You want to do it fast though, as the other workers will chase and attack you. Mission complete, we're done with Rosenberg for now. And can start working for Avery, Colonel Cortez, and a mysterious man who will give out missions from payphones scattered across the city. First, I head out to Avery's construction site, meeting the old guy in the back of his limo. He's got another piece of land he wants to buy, and another guy who isn't interested in selling. So we gotta persuade him, and by persuade, I mean murder. He's hitting some balls at the local golf course, and Tommy once again needs a wardrobe change before he'll be allowed in. You know, it's small, but I kinda like that the game has Tommy change outfits so much. It makes a lot more sense how a criminal like him could get into certain places that way. Unlike GTA 3 where Claude could pretty much stumble into any place without anyone blinking. Entering the golf course, you're instantly disarmed of any weapons you have on you, and can only use a golf club to get the job done. This can be annoying as while the target's guards don't have guns, they can overwhelm and slow you down as the target gets away. Though if you have a 500 IQ brain, you can park a car near the course's fence, and hop over without going through the metal detector, keeping any guns you have on you to make the job much easier. Though I still managed to blow it when trying this and had to chase after the guy and push him into the ocean to finish the job. Why am I like this? The next mission for Avery, Demolition Man, requires you to demolish an office building under construction so he can swoop in again to take the land. You have to use an RC helicopter to drop bombs in key spots of the building in order to demolish the whole thing within a time limit. Demolition Man seems to have a reputation as the most difficult mission in Vice City, probably because of the helicopter's controls and the construction workers who can destroy your plane. And I gotta wonder if this mission's reputation is totally overblown, or if it's another lol game journalist thing. Because I managed to complete it successfully with time to spare on my first try. I'm not trying to brag or show off because, yeah, the helicopter controls can be iffy, especially since this is the first time you'll encounter a chopper, but the actual objective of dropping off the bombs is stupidly easy once you've got the controls down, and you could just fly out of range of the first few construction workers as they only have a hammer to attack you with, and even the ones with guns don't have the best accuracy. That or just fly into them and kill them with the RC copter's propellers. Maybe the controls are worse on certain versions of the game, or people are confusing this mission with Zero's RC missions in San Andreas. Or it's tougher for those who are trophy hunting as you have to kill a certain number of construction workers with the chopper to get the trophy or achievement. Or it could just be because I've been playing so many GTA games the last few months that I've more or less got the controls down. Whatever the reason, there's one mission much, much later that is easily the worst one in the whole game. Avery is out of town for the time being, so let's knock out that first payphone mission. Payphone missions are slightly different compared to GTA 3, as before, a handful of NPCs, usually representing the local gang in the area, would call from a payphone in their territory to offer work, giving you all their missions back to back and with some being repeatable. Here, payphone missions are slowly unlocked over the course of the game, each mission given from a different payphone on the map. The missions involve assassinating different targets, sometimes with separate objectives besides just killing someone. The first one is pretty basic, just killing a pizza boy before he's done delivering pizza. Returning to Colonel Cortez, he finds out that his right-hand man, Gonzalez, leaked the details of the initial drug deal. While he's unsure of where the money went, he promises Tommy to assist in finding it. But first, Gonzalez needs to die. And he gives us a creative weapon to get the job done. Showing up at his apartment, we chase after Gonzalez before cutting him down in the streets. 
Unfortunately, we're no closer to getting the lost money back, as Tommy explains when returning to Cortez. The colonel brushes it off and asks for another favor, this time sending him to the mall to pick up some military chips from a courier. Meeting the courier, the exchange is ambushed. Not by a rival gang or something, but the French military of all things. Freeze imperialist American pig that is propriétaire of a gouvernement français. Hand it over! You won't be catching me today, you cheese-eating surrender monkeys. Escaping the French military, I take out the courier and deliver the guidance chips to the colonel. The following job for Cortez has him facilitating a drug deal for Ricardo Diaz, asking Tommy to watch over the deal and protect Diaz. He leaves us an assault rifle in a multi-story car park, where we bump into the mysterious stranger again. He introduces himself as Lance. He was actually part of the initial drug deal that went bad during the opening. Flying the helicopter that dropped off the drugs, and his brother Victor was the dealer who was killed. Despite being a disposable NPC in this game, Victor would become the protagonist of the prequel game Vice City Stories on PSP, which is the only 3D GTA game I haven't played. So I have no clue what happens in that game and who from this game is in it outside of Lance, Victor, and Ricardo Diaz. So if there's something in this game's story that leaves me scratching my head but the prequel explains it, feel free to let me know. Lance's character design is modeled after Ricardo Tubbs from Miami Vice. So much so that they have Ricardo's actor, Philip Michael Thomas, play Lance. There isn't much to Lance's character revealed just yet, only that he wants to avenge his brother by killing whoever ambushed the deal. He joins Tommy in overseeing the deal for Diaz, which predictably goes bad, as the Haitians ambush the deal. Annoyingly, you're not just trying to keep Diaz alive, but also Lance, who you'd think would be able to handle himself as he was acting like such a hotshot just a few minutes earlier. Also, the assault rifle doesn't have auto-aim and needs to be aimed manually, which is just a nightmare with the sensitivity of the analog sticks. It's frustrating to be precise, and eventually I just switched to an Uzi to save myself the headache. I live! Take head, and it's all down to you. What is your name? Tommy. I see you soon, amigo, I think. After impressing Diaz with our epic shooting skills, the obnoxious jerk will now offer us work. Before visiting him, it's time to do another job for the payphone guy. This time, a client of his wants their wife dead for unspecified reasons. Maybe she's cheating, or maybe he wants an insurance payout. Either way, we gotta make it look like an accident. Which involves smashing into her car until it blows up. Oh yeah, totally an accident. Let's go see what kind of work Diaz has got for us. Who is this dickhead? Tommy Versetti. <sighs> you remember me. Excuse me, I'm a little anxious. <sighs> Never trust a goddamn horse! Huh. Looks like Diaz isn't following rule 2 of being a drug kingpin. Don't get high off your own supply. Ricardo Diaz is a weird mix of Frank Lopez and Tony Montana from Scarface. First, his mansion on Starfish Island is modeled after Tony's in the movie, only missing his fancy fountain. Appearance-wise, he's closer to Frank, but personality-wise, he's got the same anger and trust issues as Tony, though lacking any of his redeeming qualities or smarts. One of his men has been skimming cash off the top, so he wants Tommy to follow the thief and figure out where he stashed the cash. First spying on him at his apartment before chasing the guy to his hideout on Prawn Island. Returning to Diaz, he wants us to take out all the dealers holed up at the hideout and get his money back, with this guy, Quinton, acting as your pilot. On the chopper, Tommy questions what Lance is doing there and he explains that he's put it together that Diaz was the one responsible for ambushing the deal and killing his brother. And surprisingly, Tommy has worked it out too, despite never really hinting at it until now. Leading up to this point, no one directly implicates Diaz, but there's enough evidence dropped that makes it seem like it couldn't be anyone but Diaz. It starts with the initial yacht party, when the colonel greets Ricardo. He makes mention of how work has been tiring and that he has barbarians knocking at his gate implying outsiders may have been moving on his turf. Next is the chef, Leo, that we kill for his cell phone. That phone call from his associate directly mentioning Diaz's merchandise. And then Diaz directly implicates himself at the beginning of this mission, when he brings up his concerns that just about anyone will think they can deal on his turf, directly mentioning the mafia as a possible threat. While there's no reason to question Tommy and Lance for coming to this conclusion, 
there may be more behind the botched deal than meets the eye. Oh, and we learn Lance's full name, too. One thing puzzling me. What's with Quentin? I don't know. I always kind of liked it. Quentin Vance. Vance? You name Lance Vance? Hey, I got enough of that in school. Lance Vance, poor bastard. The mission is no cakewalk, as you're again using manual aim to shoot all the dealers spread out across the hideout. The helicopter is a decent distance from the hideout, so all the dealers you're supposed to kill are tiny targets. Even exploding barrels don't make it easier. The chopper is also stationary and won't move until you kill all the dealers in a given area. The vehicle's health getting chipped away the whole time. The flying section goes on for an insanely long time, and once you land, you still have to deal with some dealers inside who can get the drop on you if you're not expecting them. So don't be surprised if this takes you a few tries if you're playing with the controller. Oh, I should bring up that Vice City introduces a new feature when you die during a mission. Sending you a taxi that will take you back to the mission giver. As opposed to driving back yourself. It's no checkpoint system, but it's less salt in the wound. Though, considering you lose all weapons when you die, you'll probably end up ignoring the taxi to get armed again. After completing the job, all the bridges in Vice City will be reopened, giving you full access to the entire map. We're done with Diaz for now as Avery is back in town and the colonel needs her help again. Let's go help out Burt Reynolds first. Tommy, this is Donald Love. Donald, this is Tommy Vercetti, the latest gunslinger to come to these parts. Hell, now, Donald, you just shut up and listen, and you might learn something. Hopping into the cowboy's limo, we get a cameo from Donald Love, several decades younger and working as a protege to Avery. In a callback to GTA 3, Avery wants to pull off the same scheme that Donald had Claude pull off in 2001 starting a gang war to lower property costs. A Haitian gang leader was recently killed. No one is sure who did it, so Avery wants to make it look like it's the Cubans in order to fan the flames of war. So Tommy has to dress up as a Cuban gangbanger and ruin the funeral by shooting up the hearse carrying the gang leader's body. And man, just how many bodies are in this car? I must have dropped like 10 coffins before I killed the driver. Afterwards, someone calls up Tommy, offering work for Leo, the cook we originally killed to take the phone. Tommy fills him in that Leo is dead, and the other guy is impressed, asking Tommy if he wants to do some work for the Cubans. For now, I'll leave that on the back burner, as it's time to visit Diaz again. That's so pleased with yourselves now, huh? <laughs> Whoa, watch where you're waving that thing. No more pigeon shit on my car, eh, hey, Tommy? Guess not. <laughs> you're damn right. Now listen. Diaz wants the fastest boat in Vice City, sending us down to the boatyard to get it. It has heavy protection though, as the guards are rocking assault rifles and are hidden around and inside the warehouse. So it's easy to get killed, like I was, if you're not properly prepared. After dropping off the boat, Tommy finds his boss struggling with his VCR. Eject! Plastic crap! You doing this to me? Who do you think you are, you piece of plastic shit? Ah! Oh. Oh. Screw you! Using the boat we just stole, he wants us to sail out to meet a yacht that sails into town once a month. To sell its cargo to whoever reaches the boat first. Joining us on this boat race is Lance, wondering why the pair haven't made a move on Diaz yet. Tommy tells him the time isn't right, that they should learn everything they can from him before taking over. The first half of the mission is fairly easy, just have to outmaneuver the other boats with Lance taking some shots at them. Not that it does much. After buying the product, Tommy takes over shooting duties, needing to protect the cargo while Lance drives. Unlike the assault on those dealers' hideout, this is a much smoother experience thanks to Lance constantly moving the boat as opposed to staying stationary. Taking a break from Diaz's obnoxiousness, it's time to help out the dear old Colonel again. This time around, he needs us to steal a tank that he plans to sell, which is guarded by a convoy of soldiers. All fully equipped and ready to annihilate you if you engage them in combat but you can make this mission super easy. Just park a car in front of the convoy, wait for the soldier in the tank to get out and move it, and then hop in. Ah, uh, how I've missed how invincible you feel when driving around in a tank, everything just exploding as they crash against you. It's been so long that I've just booted up a GTA game just to drive around and feel like an unstoppable god squishing ants. Unfortunately, I can't savor this feeling for too long as the military was smart enough to set up the tank with the self-destruct timer. 
so you gotta huff it and get the thing to Cortez's lockup or else be blown to bits. Afterwards, Kent Paul will call up offering some work, but instead I go meet the leader of the Cuban gang. See, si, man? Hey, easy, papi. This man's for me. You! You the boy? Oh, yeah. You the boy. I think so, you know. No, I don't think I do. Oh, yeah? You come here, tough guy. You think you'll take me on? You think you'll play stupid with me? No, I think you're playing plenty stupid enough for both of us. Hey, he call you dumb, son. And I call him a little girl, papi. Look at him. All dressed up like that. What is this? Ladies night? This guy is Humberto Rovina, who is voiced by Danny Trejo, and I'll be referring to him as such going forward. I probably don't need to tell you who he is and what he's been in. I mean, come on, it's Danny Trejo. But I bet you didn't know that his most iconic character, Machete, got his start in Spy Kids of all things. Machete's not responsible for nobody but Machete. But that's not what family is. We're just brothers. Cain and Abel were brothers. Look how they ended up. Wild, right? Spy Kids is part of the Machete Expanded Universe. After sizing Tommy up, Danny Trejo wants him to prove he's got big cojones, but not by dropping his pants, but instead showing off his boating skills, having to complete a course and hit every checkpoint in under three minutes. It's a little tedious, but not too bad if you're used to the boat's handling by now. Not quite sure how this little boat trip proves we've got big cojones, but whatever. Trying to get some coffee at his dad's cafe, Danny Trejo interrupts us as his boys are in a shootout with the Haitians. Instead of jumping in to support his guys and showing how big his cojones are, he has Tommy pick up his guys and bring him to the Haitians' base of operation. The Cubans are pretty useless here, so it's up to you to save the day, take out the Haitians, and steal their drug ban. Now the next job for Danny Trejo is a considerable jump in difficulty, and probably the hardest one so far. We need to ambush a drug deal the Haitians are doing, killing everyone there and taking the drugs. A member of his crew, Rico, will drive his boat over to the deal and that's where the first problem starts. You have to shoot and kill six Haitian dealers who are on two separate boats. And as soon as you shoot, they unload on you. Tommy is completely exposed on Rico's boat and gets shot to pieces if you don't kill the Haitians fast enough. Even with armor, you can barely survive this initial encounter. And because of everyone grouped together, the lock-on is unreliable in moving from target to target. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out how they wanted us to do this exactly. So I decided to come back with more firepower. Near the airport is a hotel called the Hooker Inn. And in its pool is a rocket launcher with five shots. Grabbing it, I blew up both boats before they knew what hit them. And then finished the remaining gangbangers before grabbing the drugs and running back to Danny Trejo. We have one more mission for the Cubans, but it won't unlock until we do the missions for their rivals, the Haitians. So let's switch sides. The leader of the Haitians had previously reached out to Tommy when we started working with the Cubans. In arriving in Little Haiti, Tommy is greeted by Auntie Paulette. Whoa. Whoa. Come in, my dear, and rest your soul. You must be the big bad man my granddaddy been chatting about. Tell me things about you, you know, when he visits, and about the others who wait for you. Stepping into our home, the usual angry and commanding Tommy is completely out of his element. He's stupefied as he enters, acting very awkward and unsure of himself, almost like he's been put under a spell. Auntie Paulette is voiced by Miss Cleo, who was a TV psychic you could call over the phone back during the 90s. Call me now for a bumble clock reading. Nowadays, you kiddies can hop on TikTok or whatever to get all your psychic needs. The younger generations really have it easier, don't they? She gets Tommy under her control by drugging him with her tea. The first mission for her is picking up her special powders the cops thinks are drugs. There are three drops to pick up, with cops sitting on each one, increasing your wanted level as you pick up the powders. You're also on a short timer to pick up each bundle of powder before the cops do. The aggressive cop AI at the higher wanted level can make it tough to secure the drugs in one piece, especially without a pay and spray nearby. Returning to Auntie Paulette, Tommy is starting to become lucid, but another sip of tea puts him back under her spell. She wants us to take care of the Cubans' drug boats, making use of an RC plane to blow them up. Now this is much tougher than the Demolition Man mission in my opinion. 
as the plane's controls are a lot stiffer compared to the RC chopper. It's hard to maintain altitude and keep an eye on your targets to drop the bombs on. And they'll take off after the first attack, making it tougher to be precise. At the very least, you'll get three choppers to use just in case you crash them into the water or get them destroyed. The final mission for Auntie Paulette involves the Cubans and Haitians having a traditional brawl with no guns. But Auntie doesn't trust the Cubans to play fair, and has Tommy snipe them from a building across the street to even the odds. The annoying manual aim makes this tough again, not helped by the fact you can accidentally kill the Haitians you're supposed to protect, and that the Cubans will have backup constantly coming in, so if you don't kill them fast enough, they'll overwhelm the Haitians and you'll fail. Seems the devs might have predicted as much, as on the way up to the sniping spot, you can grab an adrenaline pill to slow things down, allowing for your shots to be more precise. These pills are scattered in random spots on the map, and we're in GTA 3 as well, even though I never talked about them. They're extremely situational, so unless you know where to look or lure your enemies to where they are, you're probably only going to use them for random rampages. After helping the Haitians win, Auntie Paulette frees Tommy from her spell, but declares him an enemy, and so her gang will attack him anytime he's near their turf. It's similar to how the Triads and Mafia would shoot at Claude when he entered their turf, though they're not nearly as aggressive. So you can reasonably handle them anytime you do a mission in the area. I have to say, it's a nice touch that the devs went out of their way to structure the missions so that the Cubans wouldn't know that Tommy helped the Haitians. Or that Tommy himself even knew for that matter. Considering the type of guy he is, it'd be out of character for him to work with both sides. Or betray one side unless he was betrayed first. We can now go back to Danny Trejo to finish the last mission for him. Hey lady, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna kill me a Haitian. And then, and then I'm gonna make love like a man. You know that, Chica? Something like this. After we watch him strike out with the ladies, he wants us to destroy the Haitian's drug operation. First by stealing one of their cars in order to sneak into their factory, then by placing bombs in the factory while fighting off the Haitians. It's best to clear out the guards first, then start placing bombs from the farthest spot first, as the timer on the bombs start immediately. Run out of the factory, up the stairs and onto the roof of the nearby building, and watch the fireworks as you complete the mission. Danny Trejo will call one last time to thank us for all the help and declare Tommy an honorary Cuban. You know, all this gang warfare has really left me drained. Think I'll hit up the Malibu club and relax. All right, boss. I'm going to save your beer, mate. What the hell are you talking about? You know that Wayne Cadilla is the Bugelmeister? He's got your boy Lugs. Word is you might try to jump. You didn't jump high enough if you know what I mean. Well, shit. Looks like Lance got too impatient and blew it trying to take Diaz down on his own. Tommy will have to race across town to the junkyard. Lance is held slowly whittling down on the way there. Diaz has the place heavily guarded, his goons rocking assault rifles and some taking some decent vantage points. So despite Lance's health still taking away, you don't want to rush in carelessly. Making it to Lance, Tommy doesn't have the kindest words for him, now that Diaz is onto both of them. There goes my careful planning blown to shit. Thanks to you. You screwed up real good, Lance. He killed my brother. What do you expect me to do, mow his lawns? You're still not done with the mission, though, as you have to get Lance to the hospital with Diaz's goons giving chase. Once he's all patched up, it's time to make our move on Ricardo Diaz. I got us some cannons in the trunk. Holy shit, where'd you get all this stuff? Been saving for a rainy day. <laughs> you like? Yeah. I like. Diaz has his mansion locked down, with goons crawling all over the estate. You won't be able to get through the front door, so you have to fight your way through the back where his pool is. During this first section, I mostly took sniper shots at his guards to minimize combat. Lance is somewhat helpful here, mainly by taking aggro off the goons so you can kill them easier. But you also have to keep him alive, so you don't want to use him as a meat shield for too long. Inside the mansion, the camera and lock-on can be a bit wonky, 
most likely because of the cramped area and how the goons are spread out. But once you make it to the main staircase, Diaz will come out to confront you himself along with a few goons. Diaz! I've come to take over your business! And then you're you betrayed me, you idiot! I'm gonna kill you real soon! Because of where he's standing on the staircase, it can be tough to get good shots on him. And running in close range is an extremely stupid idea, as demonstrated by me. He also has a habit of running into his office for more cover after he's taken a few shots. Eventually, I found a sweet spot on the stairs where I could blast him and avoid taking too many shots. Finally putting an end to that fat dickhead. You stupid pricks! My beautiful house! Look what you done to it! This is for my brother! I trusted you, Tommy! <coughs> I would have had you made! Say goodnight, Mr. Diaz! Diaz now dead, we take control of his mansion and empire for ourselves. We finally did it. We made it to the top. No one can stop us now. Oh, my fault, is it? Well, I've heard you've been busy, all right. Busy killing drug barons. Busy taking over. Don't forget about us, Tommy. Because I can assure you, I ain't forgotten about you. Ah, right. Forgot all about that. Sure hope Tommy doesn't let his newfound power go to his head and he's brought down by his own hubris. Nah, that only happens in the movies. Before Tommy starts working for himself and solidifying his grip on his new empire, We've got some old friends to visit. First, we have to say goodbye to dear old Colonel Cortez, as his antics selling those guidance chips has the French government on his ass. He plans to sail out of the country and needs Tommy's assistance in making sure he actually makes it out. The French will be launching an all-out assault by sea, swarming the Colonel's yacht with several waves of agents and boats. The large deck of the yacht provides great cover. Just make sure you don't accidentally fall off into the water. After the first wave, the French will form a barricade ahead of the yacht, while continuing their assault and now attacking by air. First trying to drop off agents from helicopters before attacking with an Apache, spraying the yacht with machine gun bullets. It's a long mission, but you are given extra health and an assault rifle to pick up in case you run out of ammo. Getting the Colonel out of Vice City safely, he says his goodbyes to Tommy, asking him to keep an eye on Mercedes, and gifting him his speedboat before he disappears into the sunset, never to be seen again. Adios, Colonel Cortez. Glad you didn't end up betraying me. After the mission, Kent Paul calls up Tommy with a warning, as someone isn't too keen on him acting like a big shot now that Diaz is dead. He says to be careful, as there's now a bounty on Tommy's head. Huh, I've only been a drug lord for like 20 minutes. Who could possibly have it out for me? Probably just some hater. Time to go meet some rock stars. Hey, Tommy! Glad you could make it. Hey, you ever met Lovefish before? No, I haven't, but I've always loved your music. Let me introduce you to the band. Ken Paul introduces us to the Scottish metal band Lovefist, who are basically a parody of every hair metal band from the 80s. Like all rockers, they love to party and need Tommy's help in getting blitzed. Specifically, they want to make a concoction called Love Juice, the ingredients of which sound like you would hit up a hardware store and a gas pump to buy. But instead, you're just hitting up a local dealer. Looking for something special? I got what you need. Thanks for the money, sucker. Son of a bitch. After killing the dealer who scammed us and grabbing the ingredients, Kent Paul calls us and says to bring the boys some company. So we drop by Mercedes' apartment to ask for her assistance. Sure hope the colonel doesn't find out we're pimping his daughter. We now have a minute and a half to get back to the band before they have to perform. Which isn't too bad if you're on a bike. Something really cool about Love Fist is that Rockstar actually went and recorded a few songs for the fictional band. One of their songs, Fist Fury, started playing on the radio during the mission, which I'm unsure if that's scripted or a complete coincidence. It's kind of a banger too. Here, have a listen. Assuming the song isn't copyrighted.
After dropping off the Love Juice and Mercedes, the band will need our assistance again. Turns out they got a stalker, one who's threatening to kill them. They want Tommy to drive them to their signing and help lure out the psycho. Though we don't need to do much. I'll see Lovefist burn. Lovefist ruins my life. As he outs himself almost immediately, dressed as a groupie and killing a guard at the event before running away. Chasing after him, he eventually crashes and I kill him when he gets out of the car. Well, that was surprisingly easy. Glad I don't have to worry about that weirdo anymore. Before I can continue hanging out with the band, they need some extra security for their show. Asking us to recruit a biker named Mitch Baker and his gang. Mitch and the Vice City Bikers, a pretty mundane name for a motorcycle club, hang out at a local bar. He isn't keen on doing favors for outsiders. So Tommy has to prove himself before he's willing to lift a finger for Kent Paul and Love Fist. First, by beating some of his club members in a bike race. One I thought I screwed up right away, but the other biker's AI went wonky towards the end. So I took the win as they drove around in circles. Next, we gotta prove how badass we are, by causing as much chaos as possible. We got two minutes to fill up this chaos meter, by blowing up cars, shooting pedestrians, and killing the cops that inevitably show up. Since you're on a short timer, it's best to start shit up right outside the club. Making use of stronger weapons to blow up cars and mow down people fast. After proving our complete disregard for human life, Mitch agrees to provide security for Love Fist. On the condition that we get his bike back from some punks who stole it. I infiltrate their hideout by doing a sick jump off some stairs and landing on the roof of the ammunition. From here, I just gotta shoot my way through them to grab the bike and bounce. With his bike back, Mitch honors his part of the deal, and I return to Love Fist to give them the good news. Tommy! Tommy! Tommy, man, that psycho's back! What's going on? That psycho won't leave Love Fist alone! You didn't you kill him, man, and now he's back! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, they're in a panic, as their stalker is back. Somehow. I shot the guy dead. How the hell is he still alive? Going back through the footage, I realized he just up and vanished when I shot him and passed the mission. Normally when you kill a target, their corpse stays around for a while after getting the mission complete screen. So I guess this was the hint that he ran away? A little clunky, but alright then. Freaking out at what their stalker will do next, they ask Tommy to act as their bodyguard and protect them on the way to the show. Well, I put him down easily the first time, shouldn't be bad a second. No fist. Your time polluting the airwaves is over. I gave you the chance to be friends. Well, now I'm giving you the chance to die. You try and slow down, your limousine will explode, along with your big airy asses. Ah, well, shit. Depending on who you ask, some consider this the best mission of the game. And I do like it a lot myself. The setup is basically just the movie speed, making sure to keep the limo moving fast or risk blowing yourself up. And there aren't any scripted obstacles or cars introduced, just the regular traffic. So if you make it to that long stretch of road by the water, you're in the clear as long as you don't crash. But what makes it so great is just the antics of Love Fist in the back seat. Their banter and arguing, how they slowly discover the bomb and how they fumble around trying to defuse this thing is just hilarious. Even if realistically, they probably should have killed everyone in the limo by setting off the bomb. Somebody do something for Killer Crab, is that? I've seen braver quines. Fuck it, tough guy, you do something. Look, mate, I play a musical instrument. I'd like a clue of a bomb disposal. Well, we could just suck the boom shine out with our straw. It's a fun and relaxing little break from the usual missions. And it ends with the band inviting Tommy up on stage with them. All the side missions I had laying around complete, it's time to focus on expanding my empire. Oh, we gotta redecorate this place. We gotta make it look older. I can't stand this look. Tommy, what do you say? What do you say we put a bar in the- You're my lawyer, Rosenberg, not my interior decorator. Got it? Returning to the Versetti estate, Tommy is showing the boys around his new crib, discussing how to expand his business. Avery suggests buying some businesses to act as a front for his money, while Lance explains they should seize territory and remind the business owners that they're in charge now as some stores are refusing to pay protection now that they know Diaz is dead. Tommy decides to show those store owners not to get on his bad side, driving up to the mall to shoot out their storefronts. 
You have two minutes to get the job done, and don't have much resistance outside of some mall cops. Returning to the mansion, Tommy finds Lance and some of his guys just sulking around. According to Lance, a bar in town is refusing to pay protection, claiming they've hired another group to guard them. Pissed and berating Lance, Tommy goes down to the bar with some of the boys to kill the bar's new security, and then take out the entire security company. Tommy, we gotta talk about stuff. What's the problem, Lance? It's you, my friend. I feel you're not giving me a fair slice. Afterwards, Lance will call all pissy, bitching that Tommy embarrassed him in front of the crew and that he's not being treated fairly. Tommy doesn't apologize, but tries to clarify it has more to do with Lance making mistakes than him treating him as less of an equal. Lance doesn't see it that way and gets more emotional. So Tommy tells him to relax and take some time to cool off. So help me, Lance, if you screw all of this up for us. Returning to the mansion, I find Lance berating one of our goons, Mike. Mike was supposed to blow up a business in the mall, but screwed up and the bomb failed to go off. Now the place is crawling with cops, and it's only a matter of time till it gets traced back to us. Lance wants to cut and run, but Tommy comes up with the idea of infiltrating the mall and blowing up the place themselves. And since no one can get close but the cops, they decide to impersonate some. You'll need to drive around town with Lance and get a wanted level. Then, once the cops show up, lure them to this lockup to steal their uniforms and car. Now dressed as the law, you can stroll into the mall and blow up the shop. You'll get an instant 5 star rating and need to get to the closest pay and spray to lose the real cops. After making it back to the mansion, we'll have completed the protection ring assets and the estate will now generate up to $5,000 each day. Despite the mission going well, Lance ends up calling up to bitch like a housewife who isn't getting enough attention. He whines that Tommy isn't respecting him and talks down to him like an idiot, and begs him just to treat him equally. Christ, Lance is such an insecure little bitch. Sure, Tommy's a jerk and talking down to him a little, but Tommy's actually out there getting work done while Lance sits around and just expects respect to be handed to him. I wonder if his brother had to deal with this crap when he was still alive. Now if you'd done every mission up until now, main missions and side stuff like the gang missions and payphone missions, you may be perplexed as to why there's no missions available on the map now. I certainly was for a bit, until I remember what I had to do next. After smashing the windows at the mall, you unlock the ability to buy businesses in Vice City. These are the asset missions. After buying a business, they'll have a few missions associated with them in order for them to start generating money for you. You don't technically have to buy all 10 businesses and do their missions, just six of them, with the print works being required. But the way they show up here breaks the pacing of the game, as they feel weirdly tacked on and are the only way to unlock the final two missions of the game. Feels like it would have made more sense to pepper in asset buying throughout the game, so by the time you got to this point in the game, you'd have the majority of them done already. If you haven't been spending too much money on weapons or apartments, you should have enough to afford some assets. If you don't though, you're going to have to grind for cash in order to do so. This is mainly because you get a lot less money from completing missions compared to GTA 3. In that game, you had two moments where you needed a certain amount of cash to proceed. But because of the generous mission payouts, it was easy to accomplish. I'm guessing the devs must have realized this too and rebalance the money you earned to encourage you to invest in properties and pad the game out a little. So if you need more cash, you'll have to wait around as the assets you do own generate the max amount of profit, or drive around and kill NPCs to loot their corpses for cash, or rob stores, which I had no clue was a feature in Vice City, and thought was introduced in GTA 5. Also, it turns out GTA 4 had them too. Or you can take on special side missions. I didn't discuss it at all in GTA 3, mainly because I couldn't be bothered to do them, but entering certain vehicles will give you the option to press R3 to activate special missions you can do for cash and bonus effects. These are vigilante missions, firefighter missions, paramedic missions, taxi missions, and pizza delivery missions. I'm not going to break down each of the mission types, but they all follow a certain beat. Completing the objective within the time limit will increase your timer and increase the mission's difficulty level. The higher the level, the more money you make, and when you make it to level 12, you'll unlock a permanent bonus. 
like increasing your armor and health to a max of 150 for doing the Vigilante and Delivery missions respectively. So while they are worth doing, it does take time to make decent cash. And you lose your increasing bonus if you fail a level or leave the car. My advice is, if you don't have enough money to buy the bigger assets like the print works or the Malibu Club, do the Vigilante missions. They're easy if you got a decent police car and tons of machine gun ammo. And almost unlosable if you manage to get your hands on a rhino tank. But once you've got the cash, you unlock some of the best missions in the game. So it's worth a little bit of grinding. For the sake of time, since I know this video will probably be pretty long already, I'm going to give an abbreviated summary of what to do with some businesses before going into the better and more interesting asset missions. For the pole position club, you have to spend $300 in the club, which can be done by watching a stripper dance for 5 minutes straight. Kaufman Cavs gives you 3 missions where you have to fight off a rival cab company by dropping off a VIP client, shooting up their cabbies, and then surviving an ambush. The boatyard has you complete a checkpoint course in 2.5 minutes. The ice cream factory needs you to deal drugs to at least 50 people while avoiding getting arrested. And finally, Sunshine Autos will need you to complete and deliver a list of cars. Increasing the potential revenue generated the more lists you complete. Now let's go over the good stuff. Starting with Interglobal Studios. The first mission has Tommy meeting the studio's director, Steve Scott. Steve is a parody of Steven Spielberg, vaguely resembling the Hollywood director, and having a strange obsession with sharks and aliens, despite just being a porn director. Tommy wants to get Steve and the studio acting seriously, and generating some real cash. So the first order of business is recruiting some new girls. First is Candy Sucks, voiced by the real-life porn actress Jenna Jameson, and who first appeared way back on the Colonel's yacht with Congressman Alex Shrub. And before anyone asks, I won't show any examples of Jenna's filmography for obvious reasons. We have to kill her pimp and his gang before she's able to join the studio. And afterwards, we can recruit the second girl, Mercedes, who has no problems jumping into the porn biz. Now that we have our actresses, we need to promote the film, which we get done by dropping flyers from the studio seaplane. It's a bit awkward to control as it feels slow when trying to gain altitude and make turns. So you may end up crashing into buildings as you fly around. You need to fly through different checkpoints to drop flyers going through all of them before the plane runs out of fuel. Afterwards, our promotion of the film has gotten attention, but not the one that we wanted, as Congressman Alex Shrubs now plans to shut the production down. So we need to take some incriminating photos of the congressman with Candy to blackmail him with. We use the studio's chopper and follow Candy's limousine to the hotel where the congressman is staying. Parking the chopper, you'll go up to the hotel across the street to the Mark Vantage Point and take three photos of Candy and Shrubs, who is wearing some interesting attire. Candy notices you watching, accidentally tipping off the congressman, giving you an instant five-star wanted level. Fight your way out of the hotel and back to your chopper, and then fly back to the studio for a mission complete. The final job for the studio has Tommy wanting to do something more eye-grabbing to promote the debut of the film. Grabbing the motorcycle on the studio lot, you'll follow the quest marker to an office building, riding the bike up to a certain floor. From here, it's a standard checkpoint mission, making jumps from building to building. Since it's a bit long and you can accidentally fall off, there'll be a few parts where stairs are unlocked to get you back up onto the building. Making it to the final checkpoint, Tommy hijacks the huge spotlight to promote the movie, completing the asset missions for the studio. Next up, we got the Malibu Club. After purchasing it, the first mission sees the return of our old buddy, Ken Rosenberg. Tommy is planning a heist, but needs a crew to assist him. First looking for a safe cracker. Rosenberg suggests Cam Jones, but unfortunately he's locked up at the police HQ. That won't stop Tommy though, so he decides to just bust him out. Heading over to the police station, you'll have to change into one of their uniforms in order to get full access to the building. After grabbing a keycard, you can free Jones from his cell. Though this tips off the cops that you're not one of them. You'll now have to fight your way out and protect Jones. Avoid lingering for too long inside though as the cops will spawn infinitely and eventually kill you. After making it outside, make a beeline for the nearest pay and spray and then drop off Jones at his place to complete the mission. Next we need to recruit someone who's good at shooting. 
and Cam Jones suggests we hit up Phil Cassidy. He originally showed up in GTA 3 as an old war buddy of Ray Machowski, who needed help fighting off the cartel. His backstory here is retconned, as in 3 he was a war veteran who served in Nicaragua. As Ray himself states plain as day in this clip. An old army buddy of mine runs a business in Rockford. We saw action in Nicaragua back when the country knew what it was doing. Anyway, some cartel scum roughed him up yesterday. Said they'd be back for some of his stock today. Now though, he's a gun nut who claims he served in Vietnam. But Cam Jones has his doubts. And information that can be found about Phil shows he was barred from serving due to his drunkenness. Honestly, I don't mind the retcon. Phil was a one-off character in GTA 3. So this new backstory makes him a lot more interesting. Head to the ammunition in downtown to talk to him where you'll find him practicing in his shooting range. You'll need to show off your shooting skills to recruit him. Going through three different rounds of target practice, having to beat a score of 60 points. Controller aim is again a bit annoying, but if you take your time and don't shoot wildly, you should be able to beat his score easily. Impressed with our gunslinging skills, he's on board to help with the heist. Next, we're going to need a getaway driver. And this brings us to the most annoying mission of the entire game. Phil suggests a friend of his, Hillary, to act as their driver, calling him up to see if he's interested. He's on board, but because of his abandonment issues, for some reason, he'll only work for us if Tommy beats him in a race. Yeah, that makes total sense. I totally want someone I beat in a race to be the driver of my bank heist. They'll race around Vice City, Hillary in his Sabre Turbo, and Tommy in a dinky old Sentinel. Right off the bat, we're at a huge disadvantage as Hillary's ride blows ours out of the water in terms of speed. Then, once the race begins, you get an automatic 2-star wanted level and have to dodge the cops while trying to overtake Hillary. And unlike the biker race we did earlier for Mitch, Hillary's AI is actually competent, so you can make turns and drive perfectly. If you played this mission as a kid, I'm sure you spent hours trying to come up with plans and ways to beat him, like parking a car in front of him before the race, or trying to shoot up his ride, which won't work since it's bulletproof. As for me, I just kept doing it until I won, which took a lot of tries. Only thing I can recommend is trying to overtake him somewhere around here. From there, keep an eye on any cops coming your way, and slow down anytime you need to turn, avoiding a few spots where scripted cars can derail your lead. I'm sure there's other ways and tricks to get it done, so for anyone who's made it this far in the video, first of all, thank you. You're the real MVP. But comment down below what you thought of this mission as a kid and if you did any tricks to make it easier for you. Man, with all the trouble this race gave me, Hillary better prove himself during the heist. Now that all the pieces are assembled, it's time to pull off the bank job. We'll first drive out to the bank in a taxi. Tommy, Phil, and Cam changing into their disguises as Hillary waits on standby to get them out. They storm the bank. Phil holding the employees hostage as Tommy and Cam go up to the safe, killing any guards who try to play hero. The safe is tough to crack, so Cam will need the bank manager to unlock it, who Tommy needs to go find and bring back. I told you not to touch that alarm! Eventually, someone rings the alarm, and SWAT storm the building, dropping in from the vents above. Fight off the police and get outside, where Hillary will be waiting to drive everyone off to safety. God damn it. What the hell was the point of racing this clown to recruit as our driver if he ends up dying? No wonder everyone hates you, Hillary. I'm glad you're dead. Time to improvise. So kill the police block in the road, hop in the taxi, and drive like your life depends on it to the pay and spray. The heat off you, the boys return back to Cam's place to celebrate their newfound riches. This wraps up the missions for the Malibu Club and unlocks asset missions for Phil Cassidy. You'll find Phil at his scrapyard, where he almost blows himself up if one of his moonshine stills catches fire. He asks Tommy to steal guns from some Mexican gun runners in town, which requires you to crash into their trucks and steal the guns that fall off to bring back the ammunition. Returning to his scrapyard, you'll find Phil drunk out of his mind and playing with explosives, which predictably doesn't end well. Ta -da! Oh, damn! <laughs> And now you know the real story of how he lost his arm. You now have to get Phil to the hospital before he bleeds out, while you're drunk out of your mind from his moonshine fumes. 
This is replicated with the camera moving around with a motion blur effect as you try to drive. And it actually gave me a bit of motion sickness as I was driving. Your car will wobble as you drive, so I suggest keeping a medium pace and not going too fast to avoid crashing. When you get to the hospital, Phil tells you to take him to some back alley doctor instead, as he wants to avoid the cops and the Viet Cong. Once you drop off the crazy redneck, you'll be able to buy some of the strongest weapons in the game. Now all that's left is the print works. Mr. Vassetti? Hey, you bought the old print works? Yeah, my old man used to work on these. The first mission begins with Tommy inspecting the place, meeting this nice old man who works here, Ernest Kelly. Tommy gives us some backstory about his childhood, explaining to Ernest that his father used to work for a print shop too, and that Tommy was going to follow in his footsteps before becoming a criminal. Tommy wants to keep the print works as a legit business, but Ernest suggests that he use the place for counterfeiting instead. They just need some quality printing plates first. He tips him off about a counterfeit syndicate working out of Florida, and after hitting up Kent Paul for more info, we find out a ship captain may know how to get those plates. After going down to the boatyard, fighting off the ship's crew, and getting the info from the captain, you'll find out a courier will be moving the plates soon. The next mission is ambushing that courier as they fly into Vice City. A small army of women will be guarding the drop-off zone, and they're all seriously strapped, so make sure you got armor and some heavy artillery of your own. If you kill the courier as they arrive, you can steal their chopper to get away. If they make it to their car, you'll have to chase them down for the plates instead. This wraps up the final asset mission, unlocking the final two missions of the game. We'll get a call from Rosenberg that something's up at the print works. And checking in on the place, we see someone's roughed up Ernest. He fills us in that some mafia goons working for Sonny Forelli came in to collect their cut of Tommy's business. Pissed off, Tommy will hunt them down around Vice City. I killed the first group of collectors near the boatyard, and killed the second group near the Malibu Club. Welp, looks like never paying off our boss and building an empire under his nose has finally come back to bite us in the ass. Rosenberg calls up again to state the obvious, that Sonny is pissed and is coming after Tommy. Then Lance will call, stating there's a huge problem and calling him back to the mansion. Time for the final mission of the game. What's going on? Tommy! Oh, good, good, good. Listen, listen, uh, listen. I like fish. I love fish. I love them as pets in bowls, or as food on a plate, but as much as I love them, I don't want to sleep with them, okay? But right now, your Italian brothers are coming from up there to fit me with some cement shoes, and I- Shut up, Ken. Sit down. Returning to the mansion, Rosenberg tells us that Sonny and some of the Ferrellis are on their way to Vice City to get their cut of what Tommy owes them. Tommy keeps a level head and instructs Rosenberg to get 3 million in counterfeit cash printed and ready to use as a payoff for Sonny. He also has Lance gather up the crew and prepare for possible violence. Unfortunately, his scheme doesn't go as planned. There's 3 million in cases. How many was it? 10? No, 11 men. That's how you get to be called the Howard Butcher. <laughs> you sent me to kill one man. One man! They hey, knew Tommy, I was coming, Sonny. Tommy, watch your tone. Anyone would think you blame me for that unfortunate set of circumstances. Just take the money. Get the damn cash. You know, Tommy, I did what I could for you. I pulled strings, called in favors. I was your friend, Tommy. I hoped you'd see sense, see what's good for business. I trusted you, Tommy, and you disappointed me. But at least someone in your chicken shit organization knows how to do business. Isn't that right, Lance? I'm sorry, Tommy. This is Vice City. This is business. <laughs> Fucking Lance. So there's a few things to unpack here before we get into the meat of the final mission. First is Tommy insinuating that Sonny set him up in the first place when it came to that hit that went wrong. Also, I've been saving this since the original botch deal, but there's some evidence that Sonny may have set up Tommy at the beginning of the game. It's small and easy to miss, but if you look at the cutscene where Tommy calls Sonny to tell him what happened, you can see piles of drugs and money sitting on his table. Remember, before this point, the Ferrellis and the other Liberty City families weren't dealing in drugs. So it doesn't make any sense that he'd be in possession of any drugs at all. Granted, other than that cutscene, nothing implicates Sonny at all. While Tommy calls him after the deal went bad, you can argue enough time passed between what happened and the phone call that someone could have got the goods up to Liberty City. 
And like I brought up earlier, all the evidence around Ricardo Diaz ambushing the deal was circumstantial. With no one really showing any proof or Diaz claiming he did the deed before he died. It's an interesting mystery. While I think it makes more sense for Ricardo Diaz to be responsible, since he was the drug kingpin of Vice City, Sonny being behind it makes it a lot more personal for Tommy, and ties in better thematically with him being the final boss. The other thing to unpack is Lance's betrayal. I'd say most players probably saw it coming, as Lance starts growing resentful almost as soon as they killed Diaz. He's constantly demanding more respect, a bigger cut of their new empire, and clearly has an inferiority complex in regards to Tommy. Pretty much every mission you do for the Versetti Estates ends with Lance calling up and crying about something. So while the game does a good job foreshadowing it, Lance's reason for betraying Tommy just feels pathetic. It's less that we mistreated Lance, and more that he's an ungrateful little bitch that expects the world while doing absolutely nothing. That he and Tommy should be equals when Tommy does all the legwork and Lance just reaps the rewards. Hell, Lance would be dead in a junkyard because of his own idiocy if it wasn't for Tommy. Needless to say, I don't think anyone was shedding any tears that we'd have to kill Lance. After the cutscene, you'll need to fight off waves of Sonny's goons trying to loot your safe. No one to cover your ass now, eh, Tommy? You're going down, you backstabbing prick. Oh, you think so? Once you've dropped enough of them, that backstabber Lance will join in on trying to kill you, but takes off as soon as you shoot him. You'll have to follow him up to the helipad and fight him off with more goons. Though you're completely exposed up here. Even the barrels, which look like they're meant to be used as cover, don't do much to protect you. Instead of just getting into a firefight, I ran past the gunfire and onto the helipad giving me a perfect spot to shoot Lance and finish off that crybaby traitor. This is the last dance for Lance fans. I said I had enough of that at school. Pick the wrong side, Lance. While you're occupied with Lance, the Ferelli goons will be looting your safe. But if you had a decent stack of cash before the fight started, you don't have to rush to defend it. Returning to the main entrance, it's time to put an end to that snake Sunny. He's rocking a Ruger and being flanked by several goons, who will continue respawning until you've killed Sonny. He can be brutal to take down, as your position on the stairs, combined with all the goons, and your lock-on being a little unreliable, makes you easy pickings for Sonny. The game helps mitigate the issue by giving you health in your office, and in the office on the first floor you can pick up health and more armor. This office is probably the best spot to fight Sonny from, as you'll have a clear shot of him, the pillars in the way act as good cover, and the goons won't enter the room. After Sonny's corpse hits the ground, you've won. The scene shifting to Tommy sitting on the stairs looking burnt out over the whole ordeal. Rosenberg comes crawling in afterwards, having miraculously survived the entire ordeal. I also kind of forgot he was here in the first place. With Sonny Ferrelli dead, along with a ton of his goons, his family's mafia is all but dead up north. This is further supported by GTA 3, as they've been whittled down to just the Ferrelli brothers in that game. And Claude ends up killing most of them working for Joey Leone. Tommy perks up, as everyone who opposed him is dead, and he's the most powerful guy in Vice City. Walking out of the mansion with Rosenberg, the pair happily look forward to their new working business relationship. Sure hope Rosenberg just keeps his coke problem under control. You know, Ken, I think this could be the beginning of a beautiful business relationship. After all, you're a conniving, backstabbing, two-bit thief, and I'm a convicted psychotic killer and drug dealer. <laughs> I know. Ain't it just beautiful? And that was Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Man, what a ride to return to. The game improved on everything that GTA 3 began. Better weapons and shooting, more vehicles and better driving, a bigger city to explore, letting you travel the map by land, sea, and now by air. More fleshed out and interesting characters, a protagonist with a voice and his own goals outside of being a hired thug, an actual story as opposed to a loosely connected set of missions, new mission types that had you doing more absurd things, like dropping off flyers to promote a porno, using RC toys to blow people up, or just driving a limo while a Scottish heavy metal band tries to disarm a bomb and quite possibly the greatest licensed soundtrack of any game. Like, ever. Some of the greatest hits of the 80s that really shaped Vice City's identity. 
and like I brought up at the beginning of the game, are so integral to the experience that you can't help but think of the game anytime you hear Billie Jean, I Ran, or the other songs in real life. To be honest, I don't know that I have any real gripes with Vice City at all. The manual aim still isn't great, but analog stick shooting wasn't the best for many games during the PS2 generation. I'd say the only real blemish would be how it handles the asset missions, as it would have made more sense to pepper them in throughout the game, instead of having players do it all at the end. Though even that's forgivable due to having the best missions in the game. To sum up my thoughts, Vice City is an incredible game that built on and improved everything from its predecessor, giving us an amazing experience in a unique setting that took us from a gritty crime game to, well, Miami Vice the game. And if the rumors regarding GTA 6 are true, I'm excited to visit Vice City again in HD in the modern era. Just hope Rockstar will pony up the cash to license Billie Jean again. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, guys. Man, you have no idea how much fun it was to play this game for the video. Well, I said at the beginning that this is the GTA I've played the most, I forgot to mention it's been a few years since I last did. So there were plenty of things I forgot about it when I was diving in. Mainly how the asset missions worked. Despite beating this game faster than I did GTA 3, it ended up taking longer to get the video done for it, as there were more things I just wanted to cover. San Andreas will be coming next month, but I hope you guys will look forward to what else I have in store for November. If you saw my poll from a few days ago, I want to tackle some GTA likes slash GTA clones, and it looks like the first of those will be Scarface The World Is Yours. I do plan to cover the rest though, I'm actually kind of interested to revisit the getaway myself. I also really want to thank everyone who's been watching my videos and gave my channel so much attention. I'm almost at 3k subs and now have several videos that have broken 10k views. Which is mind blowing to me considering I was struggling to get 100 views a video before. So thank you so much for the support everyone. Hope you all stick around as I continue to grow my channel. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like down below. What did you think of the video? Did you like Vice City growing up? Which is your favorite of the PS2 GTA trilogy? Comment down below with your thoughts, and let me know which version of Vice City you've played. PS2, PC, PS4, Definitive Edition, whatever. And if you're new to the channel, I'd appreciate your support if you subscribed. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.